Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to ACC F1 Foundation in Business Technology by KNS. I believe this might be one of your very first ACC examinations, and I bid you welcome. My name is Sarasa Mikbal, and I'm going to be your professor for F1 Foundation in Business Technology here at KNS School of Business. Okay. Now, before we get started on our first class, just a few things that I would like to clear up. First of all, what exactly does this syllabus entail? What does this whole subject entail? What's in store for you guys? Well, what I can say is that this particular subject is something and it has elements which you can apply to your everyday life, okay? Now, the relatability of this subject to your everyday lives is what makes it easier and more interesting, okay? As far as the examinations are concerned, the examination of this particular subject is quite easy. It is an, it is an entirely MCQ-based examination. It's a multiple choice-based examination. The time limit will be of two hours maximum and the paper is going to be divided into two sections. Section A, which are going to be random MCQs from all over the syllabus, and section B, which will comprise of about five short case studies, okay? Or, you know, I don't like to call them case studies, let's, than call, let's call them short stories, okay? So you have five short stories in section B of the F1, uh, of the F1 exam, and you basically have to solve all the MCQs related to that particular short story okay now since this might be your first acc examination and your first acc subject let me tell you that this is going to be a very wonderful journey i'll try my level best to make things as easy and relatable to you as possible okay so now since we have established a ground I wish you all the very best for your upcoming F1 lectures and your overall ACCA journey. If you have any questions, any doubts, any queries, please feel free to reach out, okay? Now, let's get started with our first chapter, which is business organizations and their stakeholders. Now, basically two things, business organizations and their stakeholders. Two different things, okay. Business organizations, well, I believe you're all quite familiar with them, okay. From a simple hot dog cart or a simple fruit vendor or a fruit uh, or a flower seller, okay, to multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar industries like Google, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, Meta, which is formerly Facebook, right? All of them are businesses. All of them are business organizations, okay? And all of them have some differences and some similarities, okay? And they have their stakeholders. Over here, we have a saying in the business community that every shareholder is a stakeholder. Every shareholder is a stakeholder, but not every stakeholder is a shareholder, okay? Now, what does that mean? We'll come to that shortly. It, there's a very, very interesting concept. Once we go through that, you will understand what this terminology, what this saying actually means, okay? So let's get started. Moving on to what exactly an organization is, an organization we can best define as a collective. You know, it's a combination, it's a gathering of people who come together, who are employed, who are grouped together in order to achieve common goals, who are directed at a specific mission to go and achieve it, right? So, what they do is, there is a terminology called factors of production, okay? There are basically four factors of production. We have the land, labor, capital, and enterprise, okay? What the enterprise does, okay? What the enterprise does is it combines the remaining three factors of production, land, labor, and capital, and it organizes them. It combines them to achieve a common goal, 
okay, to achieve the purpose which the enterprise or the entrepreneur has set out to achieve, okay. Now, there are some common characteristics of every single business. No matter what your business is, my friends, no matter what your business is, you will find some common similarities in all of them. From the simple fruit seller to Microsoft, from the hot dog seller to Tesla, okay? Now, what those characteristics are, let's take a look. First, we have every business wants to improve their performance. They want to have rules in place. They want to have procedures in place so things are done in a very smooth and professional manner. They offer specialization. They offer specialized training, specialized goods and services. You don't see Tesla making hot dogs or you don't see uh, Meta uh, having a fast food restaurant or you don't see Google selling flowers or you know growing flowers. Why? Because they are not designed, they're not specialized in their particular task. These guys are focused highly on uh, information technology, cybersecurity, all the IT based stuff, right? But the fruit seller, he has excellent knowledge of what to grow, where to grow, how long it takes for the fruits and vegetables to grow. Okay, why? Because he is specializing in that skill. He knows what that entails, what growing of the plants entail and what it requires, right? So once we have specialization, each and every business will be offering his own variety of goods and services, okay? Which they specialize in, which they're adept at, okay? Then again, we have goals. Every business has its own goals, okay? The first and foremost goal is profit maximization. To earn as much profit as possible. Okay, now this, now this, this is something it is the unspoken rule of business. Every business in the world, every business in the world from the fruit seller to Tesla, all of them want to maximize their profits. They want to have as much profit as possible. What? Okay. So they can achieve all of their other goals, right? Yes, some businesses might have uh, the goals like, you know, we want to increase our market share. We want to keep our customers happy. We want to uh, like, uh, you know, keep innovating, bringing new designs and, you know, variations to our products. But at the end of the day, it's, it all boils down to profit. It all comes down to money, you know, as they say in the movies. All right. Now, some of the products, they have to go through a process, right? Like, for example, you see this marker, okay? You see this marker. Now, the marker was not you don't just, uh, it did not just appear out of thin air, okay? Now, I can see that there is some plastic, okay? And there is some writing and some stickers on the marker, okay? So, what did this entail? Someone possibly got out and said, hey, listen, we need to create some markers. Now, how are you going to create this marker? You are gonna need raw materials, okay? We are going to need some raw materials and we have to process it, we have to get some people, we have to get some machinery, we have to process it, and after the process, we can get the marker, okay? So the raw materials here are the input. The process is all the labor, all the people, and all the machinery which goes into making the marker, and at the end of the day, you get the output, the final output, which is the marker, right? So most businesses have this, uh, system in place, obviously, but not all of them. Like for example, the service industry, the banking sector, the insurance sector, okay? Uh, the teaching profession, okay? The teacher in front of you as it is, I don't have any input, I don't have a process, I'm just giving you the output, right? So, mostly the physical goods, okay? The physical goods have to go through the input and process method. The service industry, maybe not so much, right? Okay, let's go forward. Why organizations exist and how are they different? Okay, in the previous slide, as we saw over here, we saw the similarities, okay? We saw what brings businesses together, okay? What common things they share. But over here, what we are going to do, we are going to see how are they different and what's the purpose of having these businesses? Why do we have these organizations, right? I mean like, okay, yeah, like maybe if I put in enough hard work, I can make this market by myself, 
right? Or I can make this cell phone by myself, okay? Why do I need to create a business to do that? Well, let's take a look. To overcome individual limitations, my friends, because I alone am not a one-man army, okay? As an individual, I don't have hundreds and thousands of different skills to manufacture everything I need, okay? And assuming that I even do, there's not enough time, okay? I might have other commitments as well. So businesses are overcome, uh, businesses overcome, sorry, businesses overcome. So businesses overcome their individual limitations by bringing different people of different skills and different backgrounds and different uh, specializations together, okay? They create the business so they can help each other. Okay, there's a concept of synergy, which is gonna come later on. Synergy is what you call, you know, when two people come together, they can make one particular task very uh, easy, okay? Or they can finish up that task much quicker than it would take one person to do so. Synergy is something what we call two plus two equals to five, right? Now, we've talked about specialization. It saves time, obviously. We just talked about it, okay? Like for example, if it takes me like uh, three hours to do something or like uh, five hours to do something, okay? If it takes me five or six hours to do something, if my friend comes and helps me, maybe we can get it done in like two hours, two and a half hours, okay? So businesses deploy these people, they employ these people, they bring them together, so a lot of work can be done in much less time, right? Shared knowledge, many people, again, from different backgrounds, from different cultures, they have unique ways of getting things done, right? There's a lot that we can learn from each other, from different countries of how the work is done over there, okay? The amalgamation of all the different cultures and you know uh, professional ethics, all that sort of stuff. When it comes together, it creates a very efficient workplace, okay? And we have synergy, which we just talked about that. The more people jump in, the more expert people, the more specialized people, they jump in, they help out, they share their knowledge, they share their expertise. So you can gain much more benefit from two or more people combined than you would do on your own, okay? Now, let's talk about how organizations are different. Over here, I'll be explaining some of these points through an example, okay? And that example, again, is going to clear up a lot of stuff for you guys, okay? So just bear with me here. Ownership and control, we are going to discuss just a little bit later, just need a few minutes, okay? Activity, again, Tesla is doing something different, Google is doing something different, um, you can say Procter & Gamble, they're doing something different, Tetra Pak is doing something different, uh, PwC, Ferguson's, Pricewater, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, they're doing something different, the hot dog seller, a restaurant, they're doing something different. So organizations are differ in what activity they're doing. Okay, now, profit or non-profit? Okay, now, I apologize. I said earlier that every business works for profit. That is not the case always, okay? There are some non-profit organizations in the world as well, right? Now, I'm pretty sure wherever you're watching this video from, you must know of some NGOs, non-government organizations or NPOs, non-profit organizations, which are mostly charitable organizations, right? Now, what they do is they don't work for profit. They work for welfare. They are supporting noble causes like, you know, they're helping out orphans. They're helping out the homeless people, right? They're helping the elderly, the disabled, all sorts of stuff, okay? And they're doing a very good job, most of them, right? So these companies or these organizations, they're not run by profit or, the, or they're not run with the intention of profit they are usually run by donations and, and often governments help them out, okay? So every business, they work, it works for profit. Every business, they work for profit, but there are some businesses, or you know, I would not like to call them businesses as such, just, let's just call them charities, okay? Now these charities, they don't work for profit. They work for welfare, the betterment of people, okay? 
Legal status, we'll get to that in a minute. Trust me on this, guys. It's, it's, it's something very, very interesting, okay? Size, Tesla, okay? Big company, huge company, Apple, and we have a small fruit seller, okay? Huge difference, guys. Huge difference, right? Now, sources of finance, again, to be discussed. And the technology they deploy. Okay, now you, this probably goes without saying, right? Just imagine the level of technology available at uh, Apple headquarters, okay? At Meta, at Google, at Microsoft. Now, these guys are like about 100% dependent on technology, right? Without technology, they probably cannot get anything done, right? But consider the hot dog seller, okay? What kind of technology does he need? Probably a cell phone with a QR code for payments or a credit card machine. That's it. Like that's all of the technology he, he probably needs, right? So there are businesses who are either entirely or overly dependent on technology and some businesses who can well go fairly well without it, well, you know, without the technology as well, okay? Now, the three points that I skipped, ownership and control, legal status, and sources of finance. Let me introduce you guys to the concept of limited liability, okay? Now, before we move on to what limited liability actually is, let me tell you the three most common types of businesses, okay? The three most common types of businesses. One is the sole trader. The one, the first one is the sole trader. He, the, now this guy is someone who owns all of his business, okay? He owns all of the business, right? He is the boss. He is the boss, he's not answerable to anyone. He's the one and only boss and everyone listens to him, okay? He's the one who employs the people, he's the one who fires the people, he's the one who organizes the factors of production, land, labor, capital, remember? Okay, so one man show, the, the sole trader, right? In the second, we have the partnership. A partnership, as you can imagine, is like more than one people. Okay, two or more people who come together and they start a business together. Like let's say me and uh, four of my friends or three of my friends, okay? The four of us pool our resources together. We pool our money together and our, exp uh, and, our uh, and our expertise together. We pool our money together. We pool our expertise together and we start up the business, right? And we allocate like, okay, I'm gonna get 20% of the profit, my friends are gonna get 25% of the profit, you know, all, all that partnership agreement stuff. Now, sole trader and partnership, okay? But there is a third type of business that you can do. And that third business organization is called a company, okay? Now, how does a company start? What is a company exactly? Now, Let's take the example of a partnership, okay? Now, in the partnership of what's happening, the, okay, we are, we are four friends, right? In the partnership, we are four friends, me and three others, right? So in partnership, we had our own money, we invested that money, and we started the business, right? But let's assume, guys, let's assume that uh, the four of us, we are very competent, we are very experienced, we have a lot to offer, but uh, we're broke, we are broke, we don't have any money. Now this is gonna be a big problem because nothing, this, because nothing in this world is free. So what are we gonna do? We could ask for a bank loan, but uh, it seems a bit risky, okay? We went to the bank, they said, sorry, we cannot take that risk, we're not gonna give you the loan. All right, the bank does not trust us, but the people do. People know us very well. So one of my friends suggests that, hey, listen, maybe we can do one thing. Let's start up a company. Now, and how do we start a company? We take the money from the general public, okay? We issue them shares of the company, okay? We issue them the shares of our business, right? They will give us the money, 
okay the general public they're going to give us the money and we are going to start the business and operate that business using their money and all the profit that we make we are going to distribute it to the shareholders right the general public now that seems like a good idea okay but before we get further into this i want to give you guys one rule to remember the golden rule over here the business belongs to the investors the business belongs to the investors right now in the sole trader that one guy was the investor he poured all his money in right in partnership the partners pulled in all their money so the sole trader and his business they will be considered as one entity as one person okay the sole trader and his business are one the partnership and their business are one okay but in the case of a company the money does not belong to me okay me and my friends are just acting on behalf of the shareholders right the shareholders are the owners of the business because they are the ones who have invested right the shareholders have have given us their money they have bought our shares they have purchased our shares they are the legal owners of the business we are just their employees you can say okay we are their agents we are their employees we are just running the company on their behalf okay now so the business belongs to the investors in the case of the company the shareholders are your investors right now the sh the shares have been given out people from all over the world okay we list our shares on the on the stock exchange people from all over the world from the us the uk europe middle east uh, southeast asia uh, russia china australia all over the world people invest in our business okay since we are so famous people in, are investing okay and we start up the company we start up the business everything is going smooth all good right but then a problem occurs we find out we find out that our assets we find out that our assets are less than our liabilities right means we have a high number of liabilities let's just take the example of a bank loan okay our bank loan is high but our assets are very few okay so we have a high amount of liabilities but a less number of assets right let's take the example that our liabilities our liabilities are 50 million dollars the bank loan is of 50 million dollars and the assets that we have in the company meaning like if we sell everything if we sell everything our assets they're going to get us maybe 20 million dollars so we have assets of 20 million dollars and our liabilities are 50 million dollars so there's a 30 million dollar gap right now this is going to be a big big problem okay because right now if the bank demands its money back we will not be able to pay it okay but before we go into the company's uh, loss or assets and liabilities let's consider what's going to happen with the sole trader and what's going to happen to the partnership business now as i mentioned before that the sole trader and his business are the same they will be treated as the same under the law they're going to be treated as the same okay the sole trader is just one guy and he has poured all of his money and so he is the owner of the business and he has taken the loan he has taken the loan from the bank that 50 billion dollar loan so it's not his business or him alone who has taken the loan the bank will regard that the person himself has taken the loan as well okay how is that possible let me explain now the sole trader his business is, is not doing too well okay he defaults on a couple of payments okay and the bank gets angry he said hey listen buddy uh, sorry but uh, you know we're not uh, going to give you any more extension on the loan you know whatever you owe us you have to pay it up right now 50 million bucks cough it up right full mafia style so 
what the sole trader does, he says, hey, listen, uh, I don't have 50 million with me right now, but uh, you know what? I'm going to sell all of my business. Okay, I've sold my entire business and I have $20 million with me right now. I, I have about $20 million with me right now. Here you go, goodbye. Bank says, hey, hey, buddy, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not so fast, not so fast. You, my friend, still owe me $30 million. The sole trader says, no, I don't. Like, I got the loan for my business, okay? The business did not do too well. I sold my business, I gave you whatever money I had, it's done. The bank says, not really. Because legally, you and your business are the same. Legally, you and your business are the same. The person operating the business, the sole trader and the person himself, they're the same. Sole trader business and the sole trader, they're the same. Okay, so even if you took the loan for your business, it applies to you personally as well. Okay, now what does that mean? It means, it means that we are going to sell off your personal possessions in order to fulfill the bank loan. We are going to auction off your house. We are going to auction off your cars. We are going to auction off your uh, you can say your wife's jewelry maybe, okay? Any antiques you may have. We are going to auction off all of these personal possessions of yours until the bank loan is repaid, okay? Now, this is a very, very dangerous situation because it can practically bankrupt you. It can bankrupt the sole trader and basically just throw him out on the streets, okay? Now, this is a very, very severe situation, okay? Because if he is not able to repay the loan, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, out, uh, he's out on the streets, okay? The same problem will be faced by the partners, okay? The same problem is going to be faced by the partners, four partners operating the business. The bank is going to hunt each, each and every one of them down. If the partnership is not able to pay off their loans, the partners in their capacity, they're going to be selling off or auctioning off their personal assets in order to repay the bank loan, okay? So, this is a problem which is faced by sole traders and partnerships. Now let's come to the company. Now let's come to the company. Now what's going to happen in case of company? Remember the golden rule, my friends. What was the golden rule? The business belongs to the investors, right? In the company, same problem, okay? 50 million assets, uh, 50 million liability, and 20 million assets. Now, again, the company did not do too well, and uh, the bank comes, says, hey, listen, you have defaulted on some payments, time to shut down the company and repay the loan. We say, okay, we can shut down the business. We are shutting down the business. We have 20 million, here you go. Buddy, not so fast. I'm sorry, you still owe us $30 million. Uh, we personally don't, okay? I'm just the director. I'm just an employee, okay? I just work here. I don't owe you anything. What do you mean? I mean, you are wearing this suit. You are, you know, <laughs> running this whole company. You, you are running this whole business. What do you mean it's not your responsibility? I said, hey, listen, I'm the director. I run this company, but I do not own it, okay? I'm just an employee, I'm just an agent, okay? I don't own the business. If you want to get your money back, talk to the owners, right? Okay, where are your owners? Who are they? Um, we are a company and we got our money from the public, okay? Any specific individuals? Uh, well, this is going to sting, but our owners are spread all across the world, okay? We have owners in the US, we have owners in the UK, we have owners in Europe, we have owners in Middle East, we have owners in Asia, we have owners in uh, Australia, we have owners all over the world. What do you mean? 
buddy, shares, okay? People from all over the world invested in our company. Somebody bought uh, 20 shares, someone got 100 shares, someone got 1,000 shares, someone got 15 shares, someone got a single share, okay? We do not own the business, the shareholders do, and they're spread all across the world. You're most welcome to, you know, get the money from them. But I'm just an employee, you cannot force me to pay anything. Now, practically, technically, and feasibly speaking, it is not possible for the bank to encircle the whole globe, getting to the shareholders and asking them to repay the bank loan. It's not possible for the bank, right? So in this case, in this particular case, the bank is going to just cry about it and suffer the loss of $30 million, okay? So over here, my personal possessions as the director of the company, they are safe. The personal possessions of the shareholders of the company, they are safe. Yes, the money they invested in, uh, the money they invested into the company, yes, that is going to be gone because you know everything is sold. So the money the shareholders invested, only that particular amount is going to be lost, right? When the company winds down, but their personal assets, their personal belongings, their house, their cars, their antiques, their jewelry, all of that is going to be safe. The bank is not going to come after the shareholders, okay? Now this is a huge benefit I, or I would say the most important benefit of operating your business as a company, okay? This particular concept, my friends, when your personal assets are safe, this particular concept is known as limited liability. This particular concept is known as limited liability. And in the case of sole traders and partnerships where their assets were sold off in order to fulfill the bank's uh, legal loans, that was acknowledged as unlimited liability, okay? Your liability is unlimited until the bank loans are repaid. But in the case of limited liability, you are only liable for the amount that you have invested, okay? Your personal possessions are safe. So this is something which is incredibly important to the shareholders and everyone associated with the business, uh, you know. So. I hope that's clear and, and I hope it answers all of the questions that you had that we uh, skipped in how organizations differ, right? So let's move on. We have the private sector and the public sector, okay? The private sector are all of those companies which are operated by people like you and me, all of the businesses which are owned and operated by normal people, okay? Like you have KFC, you have McDonald's, you have Tesla, that hot dog seller, all of these companies, they come in the private sector. These companies, these businesses are working for profit. Okay. And the public sector companies, the public sector organizations are all the businesses and all the organizations which are owned and operated by the government. Right. Now, let's move forward. But before we do, I want you to look at the first line, a separate legal personality, okay? I want you to focus on this for a minute. As I said, that the sole trader and his business, they are the same. The partners and their business, they are the same. But in case of a company, in case of a company, the company is separate, the company is separate, its directors, the ones who are running the company, they are different, they're separate. And the shareholders, the owners, the investors of the company, these guys are different, okay? They are not interconnected, okay? So the shareholders are free to do as they please. The directors, they have to do what the shareholders tell them to, in a way. But the company itself, the company itself is a separate legal entity. Like it's an artificial person right here, okay? It's an artificial person. Yeah. Now, as an artificial person, as an artificial person, a company has every right to all of the things which are entitled to a normal person. Like for example, like a normal person, a company can own assets in his own name. Okay, the company can sell assets under its own name. The company can file a case against someone 
under its own name the company can uh, be sued like a normal person right so consider the company as a separate entity as a separate artificial person okay which has almost all of the rights that a normal person has okay let's move forward over here we see how profit and non-profit companies or businesses they operate let's take a look at profit oriented we have the small diagram over here right now we see the primary goal the primary goal is profit maximization that we just discussed a few minutes back okay what they do is they get the input the raw materials which we discussed they get the raw materials they process them they turn them into finished goods or the output they sell them and maximize their profits and if it's a company they distribute that profit to the shareholders right but in case of non-profit organizations as i said before that they're usually funded by the government okay so the government finances them through taxes right and most of their operations are exactly the same as the profit oriented they also need raw materials to manufacture the goods okay they manufacture them the uh, they manufacture the raw materials into finished goods right and they provide them to the people who need them right the orphans the homeless the needy all those kinds of people okay right and whatever leftover money they have that is reinvested back into the business all right now let's talk about the types of directors the people who operate the business on behalf of the shareholders right we have executive and non-executive directors the executive directors are all those people my friends who operate the day-to-day -day running of the business all the day-to-day -day operations the daily tasks the supervision the organizations on a daily basis these guys are full-time directors they're full-time employees of the company right but non-executive directors they're more like freelance directors which you hire uh, for their expertise right like someone like for example if you are planning like uh, you are planning to expand your market to asia okay you operate in the middle east and you want to move to asia okay so you will hire some non-executive directors on a contract basis who have expert knowledge on the Asian market okay they will come onto the board of directors they will give their valuable opinion they will tell you about all this stuff about how the Asian market operates and then once their job is done they can leave okay these guys exist to provide a neutrality and a balance to the board of directors okay and an independence to the board of directors a neutral voice an independent voice okay now Operational management is often held and operated by the executive directors, okay? All the daily tasks, all the uh, daily reporting, all that is done by operational management, which is mostly held and done by the executive directors. The, uh, which, is mostly, which is mostly done by the executive directors. All right. Now, let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages of limited companies okay limited companies again all those companies which benefit from limited liability well we have already talked about a lot of advantages the main advantage being your personal possessions being safe there are a few others but it's a bit difficult to contemplate whether they have any disadvantages but trust me there are all right let's take a look at the advantages i'm pretty sure you're familiar with uh, quite a few of them now but just to be safe let's take a look Okay, more money is available since all of the shareholders from all over the world are easily able to invest in your business. All you have to do is put your share up on the stock market and whoever is interested can buy your shares. Okay, limited liability, your risk is reduced. Again, we talked about this in great detail. Your personal possessions are safe. Only the amount that you invest in the company, that is at risk obviously, but everything else, safe. All right. A separate legal personality, we just talked about that as well, right? Ownership is separate from control. The, now, this is not really, uh, I would say, a big advantage as such, but like, uh, okay, now we have shareholders, right? And 
we have shareholders who have maybe just one share, 10 shares, 15 shares, 100 shares. And there are some people who have like 10,000 shares, 50,000 shares, 100,000 shares of my company. Okay. So how you are able to influence the decisions of the company, how well you are able to influence the operations, the tasks of the company depends on how many shares you have. The more shares you have, the more you can say priority you will be given to by the directors. Okay. No restrictions on size apply. Some companies have millions of shareholders. Well, if you're able to invest from all over the world, well, you can just imagine where all that money will take you, right? Just look at how many shareholders Apple has, how many shareholders Google, Tesla, and Microsoft have, okay? Millions, millions, right? And the final advantage is that they offer flexibility. Like capital, which is, which is one of the factors of production, and enterprise, a second factor of production, they can be brought together, okay? Capital is all the physical equipment you need in order to operate the business and enterprise like we talked about executive and non-executive directors basically basically these guys are leaders of the business okay and companies can often hire them very easily based on their research and their experience okay however not everything is without its cost so let's discuss the first disadvantage of the limited companies it's not as easy to set it up. There's a mountain of paperwork that you have to go through, okay? So many documentations and you know, you need evidences, you need signatories, you need uh, stamp papers and you know, all of that stuff. You need a lot of paperwork to get your company up and running, okay? The shareholders have little practical power. Just as we discussed that if you're a minority shareholder, you probably don't have that much power. Yeah, but if you band together, Many of the small shareholders, they come together, then they can make a difference. But one individual guy who has maybe like 100 shares of the company, that guy is probably not going to make much of a difference, right? Okay. Some advantages and disadvantages of the public companies, right? All the companies owned and operated by the government, right? Let's take a look. The first advantage we have is everyone has access to health services, right? Everyone is able and everyone is given healthcare, okay? Maybe not in every country, but governments do their best, okay? Like if you go to the UK, if you go to Canada, or if you go to uh, probably any uh, European country over there, healthcare is usually free, okay? So the public sector ensures that the, that the basic needs and rights of the people are provided by are provided efficiently by the government, right? Okay, all the things that the private sector cannot do, all the customers who need the goods and services, but they're not able to afford it, all those people are given those resources and those goods and services by the government, okay? Now, economies of scale. Now, what exactly is economies of scale? Like, for example, for example, uh, let's take an example of uh, economies of scale. Now, what exactly is economies of scale? Right? It can be best defined like, for example, if I want to purchase uh, a factory or if, or if I want to rent out a factory, right? I rent out a factory, the rent of that factory is like $10,000 per month, okay? I have to pay 10,000 or let's say $100,000 per month. I have to pay $100,000 a month as rent for that factory, okay? Now, it does not matter whether I produce, uh, like let's say I make computers, right? I make laptop computers. It does not matter whether I make one laptop, 100 laptops or a million laptops. I have to pay the $100,000 rent, right? So, Let's say, let's say that I make 100 laptops. I make 100 laptops, okay? So $100,000, $100,000 rent and 100 laptops, which means the cost of producing one laptop is $100,000 divided by 100, 
it becomes $1,000. So technically, I am producing one laptop at a cost of $1,000, okay? Now, obviously, there's going to be raw materials and labor, all that stuff, but, but let's keep it simple for now, okay? So, $100,000, 100 laptops, $1,000 to make one laptop, right? Now, what I did is I, next month, I created 10,000 laptops, 10,000 laptops, right? So, $100,000 divided by 10,000 laptops, $100 to make one laptop, right? So, as I'm increasing my production, as I'm increasing my production, my cost per unit is declining, okay? And when your cost per unit is declining, that is when you are set to achieve economies of scale, right? That as your production is increasing, your cost per unit is decreasing, okay? Now, the public sector can achieve this. How? Because it is catering to such a large number of people. It's catering to the whole population of the country, right? The healthcare, the education, the merit goods, the public goods, all of these goods are being provided to so many people, hundreds and thousands and millions of people, even billions of people, you know, in countries like India and China. Okay, so if you're producing for so many people, the cost per unit is going to be less and less and less, okay? I mean, I've just given you a very basic example, but this is the crux of it, right? Now, moving on, cheaper finance, okay? Government is subsidized so many people, the government helps so many people, and the way it helps those people, the way it is able to finance all of these goods and services for the people is through taxes. It's easy for the government to collect tax. Almost everyone pays tax, right? And the government also issues government bonds, or you might also know them as treasury bonds, okay? When the government issues bonds, People buy them, people invest in them because they know that the government is not going to default. The government is going to pay them back their money, right? So it's easier for the government to raise finances through taxes and treasury bonds. And the public sector can sometimes be more efficient than the private sector, okay? Because the government has been doing these things for quite a long time, okay? So like a government-run hospital, which was established maybe like 20, 30, 40 years ago, and a new private hospital which has just opened up maybe like five years ago, okay? So the government hospital is probably gonna have more experience, okay? Now, for the disadvantages, we have the problems of accountability, we have problems of, of interference, and it is quite costly to provide so many goods and services to such a large population, okay? If anything goes wrong, in a government organization, people will just keep pointing fingers. We're gonna he did it, he's responsible, talk to that guy, right? No one will admit that, that, that it's their mistake, okay? Now this, this does not always happen. This does not always happen, but you know, there's little accountability in government run bureaucracies. Interference, or I would say corruption, okay? When there is corruption, people will not only do their work, but they will interfere with your work as well. A good public servant, a good public officer will try his level best to, you know, help the people, but if his superiors are, are corrupt, if his officers, if his fellow colleagues are corrupt, well then, it's not gonna be easy for him, is it? And again, very, very expensive. Very, very expensive, guys. Let's move forward, cooperatives. Now, what are cooperatives? Cooperatives are basically, you can say, uh, like I would say the best way to describe cooperatives is through uh, like, let's call them business communities, okay? Business communities. Now, these communities, what they do is the people who work there, okay? Or the people who shop there, they are the ones who own the business. Okay, the customer element is not that strong. Usually, usually the people who work over there, they run the business as well, okay? And they are usually family run businesses or you know, they are uh, family owned or you know, uh, generational based businesses, right? Like, like my grandfather did this business, then my father did this, uh, did this business, now I'm doing this business, 
and I'm training my son or my daughter to, to do the same business as well, right? So this is, this is what a cooperative has. What are some of the defining features? Open membership, anyone can come in, anyone can you know, uh, work and run their business at the same time. One member, one vote, okay? Each member has one vote. It does not matter if you are a very experienced guy, if you're the head of your community, or if you're a new member, you will have one vote, okay? Each and everyone is going to have one vote, equal voting power, right? All the excess surplus, all the excess surplus or all the profits that you can say is usually distributed to people, is distributed to customers who have done the most work, okay? The people who have, who have done the most work, the profit is distributed according to that, right? And the promotion of education, or I should say the promotion of business education, right? From a very young age, from a very young age, guys, these people, they train their kids about business, okay? They keep them in the business premises, they show them how business is done, right? It's like, take your daughter to work day or take your son to work day, okay? But that is like 365 days a year, <laughs> all right? So this is what's happening in cooperatives, okay? So the generational business concept is carried on, okay? Now, let's talk about stakeholders. You remember I mentioned that uh, every stakeholder is not a shareholder, but every shareholder is a stakeholder, right? Now, what does that exactly mean? Let's take a look. There are basically three types of stakeholders. There are basically three types of stakeholders. We have the internal stakeholders who are the employees and management of the business. We have connected stakeholders who are connected, who are linked to your uh, business, like your shareholders, your customers, the bank, the suppliers of raw materials. And then you have your external stakeholders like the government, the people around you, the community you're operating in, right? And pressure groups like trade unions, okay? Now what trade unions are, we'll get to that a bit later on. What I can say for right now is trade unions are organizations which represent workers in the workplace, okay? They basically fight for their rights, they negotiate for better work hours, better pay, better holidays, all that sort of stuff, okay? Okay. Now let's take a look at the internal stakeholders. The internal stakeholders, like the managers and employees of the business, they have certain interests aligned with the business, right? They have their jobs, their promotion is tied up, their bonus is tied up, okay? They want benefits on the job, okay? The benefits that like a company car or company-based accommodations or insurance or pension, all that sort of stuff and overall job satisfaction. Now, these are all the interests which these managers which these managers and employees want from their business. If these interests are threatened, my friends, if these interests are threatened, then what they can do to defend it? What is going to be their response? They are going to pursue their own goals, okay? They are going to work for themselves. Okay, they're not going to be a team which works together for a collective purpose, for a collective goal. If they're seeing that, hey, listen, the business is not, going, is not doing us any favors. If the business is not doing us any favors, I think it's best that we just work for ourselves. Okay, we just do the bare minimum, get paid and get out, right? Industrial action, negative power to, to impede implementation, refusal to, to relocate, all of these things are done by the trade unions, okay? The workers can strike, they can pick it, they can stop the work process entirely, okay? And they can refuse to relocate to any other location. They're saying, hey, listen, this is where my house is, this is where my family is, this is where I've lived my whole life. I'm not gonna just up and abandon all of them just to work for you, okay? At some remote place I don't even know, okay? So these are all the things that a trade union will probably spearhead this movement in case the company does not adhere to their demands, okay? And the final thing that the managers and employees can do is just simply resign, okay? They're gonna say, hey, listen, we're done. We don't like you anymore. We don't trust you anymore. We quit, okay? So 
Let's have a look now at the connected stakeholders. The shareholders, they're very simple people, okay? The shareholders, what they want is more and more dividends, more and more return on the shares that they have purchased, right? And if their interests are threatened, if they think that the management or the directors are doing a bad job, then what they can do is either they can sell their shares, okay? They can sell back their shares, get their money back, or they can boot out the management. Yes, the shareholders have this power. They are the owners of the business. They can practically do whatever they want if they all come together. If they say that, hey, listen, this particular director is a corrupt guy, he's a bad guy, we don't like him, he is causing all of our profits to go down, we want him fired immediately. They can make that happen, okay? They, they just have to pass a resolution and that guy is out of there, okay? So, this is the power that the shareholders have. Let's talk about the banks. I think we all know that pretty well. We've talked about the bank, what the bank can do, right? If you don't pay them back on time, the banks, they want security of your loans, okay? The collateral or, or the mortgage, you can say, right? And they want you to follow your loan agreement. They want you to honor your loan agreements, okay? Pay them back on time, pay the proper interest rate, pay the proper principal amount, all that stuff. And if you don't do so, and if the business does not do so, they can deny any further loans. They can charge you a much higher interest rate or they can go into receivership, meaning selling off all my personal possessions, right? Now, as far as now suppliers are, I would say your best wealth wishers, okay? Suppliers work for mutual profit. Suppliers want you to, you know, they want you to succeed. Now, why is that? Because suppliers business is connected to your business, right? and your business is connected to the, to the supplier's business, okay? The more you are able to sell, okay? The more you sell, the more profit you're gonna make, right? As a business, the more I sell, the more profit I'm going to make, okay? And in order to make more sales, I need to make more purchases, and I'm going to make more purchases from my supplier, all right? So if I, I'm successful, my supplier is successful, okay? So these two businesses are very interlinked together, okay? So that's why the suppliers are probably our best stakeholders or our most concerned stakeholders, I would say, okay? The suppliers want you to have profitable sales. The suppliers want you to pay for their goods on time, okay? And they want a good, positive business relationship with you over the years. But if you don't, uh, pay them on time, okay? If you don't, uh, like, or if you're going into a loss, uh, if, you're, if, you're business, uh, if your business is doing losses again and again and again, the suppliers will say, hey, listen, your losses are causing us losses, okay? You are not able to sell the goods. We are not able to supply you with the raw materials, okay? We are not going to give you any more raw materials on credit, okay? We, and if you don't pay us, if you don't pay us in cash, we are going to take you to court. We are going to file a case against you, okay? And the relationships will obviously wind down, right? Now, the customers, the customers just want what they're promised, okay? Now, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that maybe you've gone to a McDonald's, you might have gone to uh, Albeque or Nando's or uh, KFC, wherever, okay? Now you see this picture of an amazing burger, okay? Okay, the, the, it's got like big thick buns, the, you know, the, those warm toasted buns, a thick juicy patty with freshly sliced tomatoes and lettuce and pickles and these beautiful crispy fries, right? It looks so beautiful, it looks so beautiful, it looks so tempting, right? But when you are served the actual food, you're like, what's this, right? I mean, the picture and the food, they're completely different, right? It's like you put a makeup model, like you put up an Instagram model with like a ton of filters on the picture and this is her real face, right? Okay, I'm not discriminating, it's just an example, okay? Now, 
So obviously the customers, they want what's shown to them, what's promised to them, okay? But if they don't get it, they can either purchase it from somewhere else or they can sue you for misrepresentation, okay? Now this does not usually work in fast food restaurants because it's general knowledge that, you know, what you see is not always what you get. But, you know, in case if you find a bug in your food or the food is not uh, cooked properly, then yes, you can sue them, right? Now, let's move on to external stakeholders. We have the government. The government is mostly involved with tax. That's the government's main concern with the business, okay? And this I'm speaking from personal experience. Okay, so the government wants that you pay them tax on a timely basis, right? And it wants that you offer jobs and training to people in the community, uh, in the community where you are operating your business, right? If you don't do so, if the business, if the business does, if the business does not do so, it can increase your tax, okay? They can impose much stricter regulations on you, much stricter rules for you to follow. And the government itself can file a case against you. Like if you do a lot of pollution, it's probably going to find you a penalty for the first time. And if you keep doing it, the government is probably going to take you to court and maybe have you shut down, right? Now, pressure groups like trade unions, right? Now trade unions, or uh, like maybe you've heard PETA, okay? Who are an animal rights group, okay? Now these guys, they fight for animal rights. There are other pressure groups who fight for a clean environment, a green environment, okay? Like Greenpeace, okay? Greenpeace is an uh, organization which fights against pollution, okay? And these guys are powerful. Trust me on it. These guys are powerful. They have a lot of convincing power they have they have a lot of say in the media if you go against them they can make very bad publicity for you okay they can probably sabotage your business like you can see all these protesters in germany okay what's going on in germany you see these all these people who are against climate change okay they want to protect climate change so what they're doing is they're going out and they're spray painting monuments they are spray painting uh you know valuable art pieces in germany and all around the, uh, Europe, I would say, okay? They're sabotaging, they're taking direct action and they're putting pressure on the government to, you know, cut down, to cut down on carbon emissions, okay? So these guys are powerful and they're making the news. Now, professional bodies like ACCA, okay? These guys have a very simple interest, like as, an, as a professional chartered accountant, as, a, as an ACCA professional, you have to act ethically and you have to act professionally and competently at your job, okay? And if you don't do so, they can kick you out of the ACCA fraternity, right? So this was all about stakeholders, okay? Let's get a move on. Over here, we have a table on the, x-axis we have the level of interest and on the y-axis we have the level of power how much power and how much interest you have okay let's talk about a okay the people in the a box okay the people in the a box they have a low power and they have a low level of interest okay they have a low power and low level of interest. These guys are usually your minority shareholders, okay? These guys are your minority shareholders on which you just have to invest a very minimum effort, okay? Now these guys are like just, you know, uh, like they're fine. Like, like, like even if you don't, like you, if you, even if you barely pay, like even if you barely pay any attention to these guys, it's gonna be fine, okay? Like these guys don't matter much. The minority shareholders who have maybe like, 100 shares, 200 shares, let it go, right? B box people, okay? The people in the B box, they have low power, but a high level of interest, okay? Now these guys are usually your lobbyists. These guys are basically your marketers, okay? They market you, they promote you, they lobby for you, okay? With the government and all. So, but they're still your, freelance employees you can say 
Okay, now these guys are sort of your employees. Okay, so as an employee, you don't have you don't have a lot of power, but you have a high level of interest in the company because you're getting paid to do it, right? So they have a low power, but a high level of interest. So these people, you just need to keep informed of whatever is going on in the business. Okay, keep them informed, keep them updated on the latest information, what you plan to do, what you're doing right now, so they can work properly, okay? Like they can work in their best possible capacity. The people in the C box, now these guys have a high level of power. These guys are very powerful. Now these guys are very powerful within, within the, now, the people in the C box. Now, these guys are very powerful within the business, okay? These guys are your majority shareholders, people holding 15% of the shares, 20% of the shares, 15%, 30% of the shares. These guys have a lot of voting power. These guys can do whatever they want. They can take the company in any direction, okay? They can fire a director, like even if two or three of them come together. Okay, two, three major shareholders come together, they can alter anything about the company. Okay, so these people we have to keep satisfied. But why do they have a low level of interest? Because these are rich people. They don't have high shareholdings. They're not, they're not the major shareholders in just one business. They have investments in a wide number of businesses. Okay, these are rich people. Okay, so they don't care about whether one business is performing poorly or well, okay? They don't care about that. Okay, if one business shuts down, we're just going to sell our shares and move somewhere else, okay? But if 30% of a business's shares are sold in the market, its value is going to drop drastically, right? The news that 30% of shareholders have left this company is going to be a big blow for that particular company, okay? But it's not going to have much of an impact on these majority shareholders, they, they're just going to take their money and you know, go someplace else, right? So these guys have high interest, okay? So sorry, these, now, these guys have high power but low interest, okay? The majority shareholders of the business. And the people with the high interest and high power, they are the key stakeholders. Most notably, the government. Now the government is the big boss. Okay, the government is the big boss. You have to keep it happy no matter what. You have to keep all of its attention focused on that. Okay, it can be the government and if you have taken any loans, it can be the bank as well. Okay, so all of your efforts, you have to give maximum efforts to the government and to the bank. You have to follow all of their laws. You have to follow all of their agreements because if you don't, they alone have the power to shut you down, okay? So the people in the D box are more are notably your key stakeholders. Most probably they're going to be either the government, the bank, or maybe both, okay? So each of these groups, if a business does not do well, can do three things. They can either just go with the flow, okay? They can exit, like the majority shareholders, just sell their shares and move on, or they can voice their concerns. Shareholders have this uh, meeting, shareholders have this meeting every year or so, which is called the AGM, the Annual General Meeting, okay? Over there, they discuss the agenda and what's usually going on in the company, okay? And if they have any complaints, they can voice their concerns at the AGM, okay? Here, my friends, ends our very first chapter. I hope you had fun, right? Now I'll be taking all of your questions and I'll be testing you with some questions of my own, right? Okay. Now, even though this subject is completed, this particular top, now even though this particular, now even though this particular topic is completed, let me show you of how you are going to perform and how you are going to basically revise the whole syllabus, okay? Now, once you have signed up for this course, you will be provided with a study text, with some revision kits, and the teacher's exam focused notes, okay? Now, these will be imperative for you, for your practice and for your revision.
Now, since F1 is a theory-based subject, right? It's, a, it's like it's almost a 99% theory-based subject. It requires constant revision, okay? You have to keep revising. There is a seven-step revision plan which will be shared to you once you have gained the admission, that plan will be shared to you. And once you follow that plan, there's a 99.99% .99 chance of you of passing your F1 exam in the first attempt, right? Because this is the plan that we have been following for quite some time. And it involves heavy and regular revisions, constant practice, mock examinations. All of that combined is going to almost guarantee you a pass in F1. And it's going to be a great start to your ACCA journey. You're gonna start your journey with a great success right away. All right, now, all the questions that we will be doing in the class itself, we, will we, like, we have this practice of, we will have some of the benchmark questions done in these lectures, just to give you a taste of how the questions will be coming in the exam itself, all right? So I'm just going to test you guys on it, and then we can uh, see how, the, uh, how well you guys do, all right? All right, so let's start with the questions. Here's your first question, guys. Let's take a look. It's the basic definition of an organization. Now, I'll be needing your help over here, please. An organization, now I'll be needing your help over here, please. An organization is a social arrangement which pursues collective what? Which controls its own performance and which has a boundary separating from its environment. Which of the following words completes this sentence appropriately? Collective profits, collective stakeholders, Collective goals or collective tactics, which is the right answer? I personally think it's going to be goals. Option C. Let's take a look what the answer is. And yes, it is goals. Organizations are built to achieve collective goals, right? They bring people together so they can work towards a common aim, towards a common goal, towards a, a common objective, right? Good going. Let's see what the next question has in store for us. What is the term given to the idea that combined output of a number of individuals working together will exceed that of the same individuals working separately? Okay, now this is something which we have studied recently. Okay, two plus two equals to five. Now I've given you the best hint, right? Two plus two equals to five. So yes, you are absolutely right. The answer is again, option C, synergy, right? Okay, moving on. Next question, which of the following statements is true? Okay, let's look at the statements, then we can decide. Okay, let's look at the statements and then we can decide. A, limited company status means that a company is only allowed to trade up to a predetermined turnover level in only one year. Okay, a turnover basically means sales, okay? Labor turnover is how many employees are leaving your organization and normal turnover means your number of sales, okay? For organizations that have limited company status, ownership and control are legally separate. Yes, this is something which can be right, okay? I'm pretty sure it is, but let's not rush things. Always remember guys, always remember, please read each and every word very, very carefully. Each and every word of the questions, each and every word of the answers, do not rush. Even if you think your answer is 100% sure, please do not rush, read everything very, very carefully. One word can alter the meaning of the entire sentence. Okay, so please be careful. Option C. The benefit of being a sole trader is you have no personal liability. I don't think that's true. No, because we have discussed that sole traders have unlimited liability, meaning their personal assets are also at risk. Okay, so C cannot be the answer. D, ordinary partnerships offer the same benefits as limited companies, but are usually formed by professionals like doctors and solicitors. Um, I don't think so because partnerships can be formed by regular people like you and I, okay? Let's take a look at what's the right answer. I'm pretty sure that you have selected the right answer, but let's see if your bet or your choice was correct. The answer is B, you're right. 
Okay. Separation of ownership and control is possible in limited liability companies. Right. Moving on. An organization is owned and run by central government agencies. Okay. The organization should, the organization should be described as what? A voluntary sector organization, private sector, or public sector. Okay, I think this is pretty straightforward, guys. Okay. If you've on, if you have answered anything, if you have answered anything other than C, I think you guys might need to revise some concept or you may need to rewatch this video. <laughs> right? Okay. Moving forward. Which of the following groups may be considered to be stakeholders in the activities of a nuclear power station? Oh my God. All right. Now, we have the government, we have pressure groups, we have employees, and we have local residents. Now, out of these four stakeholders, guys, out of these four stakeholders, how many of them, or which of them, I would say, which of them will be affected by activities of the nuclear power plant? Okay, just one, three, and four. One, two, three, four, all of them just the employees or just the government and the employees i think i think that all of these people all of these stakeholders will have a say and they will be affected about the operations of a nuclear power plant because a nuclear power plant is a pretty big deal i mean i'm pretty sure you guys might have heard of chernobyl right like so much disaster happened over there and everyone was affected everyone was involved so, if your answer is B, then you are absolutely right. All of these guys are going to be affected by a nuclear power plant, okay? The employees, okay, they are working over there, so they're the direct stakeholders, the government, it has to impose regulations on them, okay? The environmental pressure groups to, you know, avoid a disaster like Chernobyl and the local residents who are living there because they are at risk, I mean, in case of an accident, these guys are going to be severely affected, right? So all of these are stakeholders in the activities of a nuclear power plant. The next question, who are the secondary stakeholders? Okay, the term secondary stakeholders describes which group of stakeholders? Okay, they are the ones who conduct transactions with the organization, maybe. Stakeholders who have a contractual relationship with the organization, maybe, or stakeholders who do not have a contractual, uh, contractual relationship with the organization. Okay, I think C might not be the answer. It's either going to be A or it's going to be B. But again, as I said, read each and every word very, very carefully. Okay, the answer of this question, ready? The answer of this question is C. Stakeholders who do not have a contractual relationship with the organization, okay? Secondary stakeholders. Now, who are these guys? Let me tell you. Secondary stakeholders are stakeholders who do not have a contractual relationship with the company. Now, what is the answer of this question? Ready? Is it A, is it B, or is it C? I think you guys might have picked the wrong answer for this one. The answer is C. Stakeholders who do not have a contractual relationship with the organization. Okay. Secondary stakeholders are also known as your external stakeholders. Okay. You don't have a contract with the government. Okay. You don't have a contract with pressure groups. Okay. Like trade unions or, or like you don't have a contract with Greenpeace or PETA. Okay. So, but you have a contract with your internal stakeholders and your connected stakeholders, okay? You have a contract with your employees, you have a contract with your managers, then you have a contract with your suppliers, you have a contract uh, with your uh, consumers, your shareholders, right? But the government or the trade unions, the pressure groups, you don't have any contract with them, right? So. All the external stakeholders are called your secondary stakeholders and your internal and connected stakeholders are also known as your primary stakeholders, right? Moving forward, 
which of the following organizations would rely most heavily on value for money indicators and efficiency rather than information on performance and profitability okay this looks like a interesting question let's read it again a bit slowly and a bit more carefully this time all right which of the following organizations okay we have a private accountancy college like kns we have a local authority let's call it uh, the police and a small retailer a small shop which offers you know which, which which just sells the goods right a small retailer shop okay which of the following organizations would rely most heavily on value for money indicators value for money means more bang for your buck right more value for your money which of these following organizations would rely most heavily on value for money indicators and efficiency rather than performance and profitability now which of these organizations they want more value for money and efficiency they don't well like they're not bothered with performance and profits is it a private college like kns is it the police or is it just a small retailer i think you guys might have picked the right answer for this one and if you have picked b you were absolutely right the police wants the police the local authority it is not concerned with profit okay it is not concerned with performance they want to be more efficient okay they want to focus on efficiency and they want to utilize the government's tax dollars okay they want to utilize the government's tax dollars the best way they can so they can purchase the best equipment and they can handle all their responsibilities in the best manner possible okay so the answer of this question is b a local authority like the police right next question adb is a business which is owned by its workers owned by its workers which company is it talking about sole trader partnership company or cooperative cooperative right okay now we've already got the idea owned by workers cooperative it's in built in your mind now right the workers share the profits and each have a vote on how the business is on how the the workers share the profits and they each have a vote on how the business is run okay now we are pretty sure it's a cooperative which of the following should be used to describe the adb yes you are absolutely right the answer is cooperative right having fun right and here and here my friends we end having fun well sadly guys the fun has to end over here chapter 2 we will be starting in our next class i hope you had fun i i had a lot of fun i love teaching and it's an honor it's a privilege to be with you guys right here right now teaching you trying my level best to impart my knowledge on to you guys right i will see you in the next class i really hope that we can continue this journey together i really hope that we can continue this journey together and i look forward to an amazing amazing awesome f experience with you guys right just follow the seven steps that i'll be sharing with you guys upon admission and i can guarantee you that you are going to pass this course with flying colors right i wish you all the very best for your entire ecca journey and if you have any questions or any queries or you just want someone to talk to i'm always here i wish you all the very best and i will see you in the next class where we will be studying chapter number 2 the business environment again a very interesting subject something a lot of new things a lot of old things a lot of interesting things we will be discussing in the next chapter right so i bid you guys farewell and i'll see you in the next class goodbye